Yes. Don't worry. This is this is not. You have come to the right. This is still Scala world. This is not like the local um, people with strange strange interests club. Although maybe that's true of Scala. I'm not sure. Um, let's get going. Why not? Um, so. What we're here, and we'll go into a little bit of detail as to what the title is about, but, but you're here. Thanks very much for coming. The workshop is about essential versus or accidental complexity in Scala, so where we are today, and in Dotty, uh, where we'll be going soon, hopefully. And um, I guess the main question is, can we go towards a future of these languages that uh, removes some of the, the, the puzzling behavior that we see? So let me do the about me bit. Uh, my name's Andrew, uh, Andrew Phillips, so I am AP, but I'm not actually AP Marky, um, so I can now take off the, the paper bag. Uh, I am the uh, co-maintainer, or one of the maintainers of the Scala Puzzles website, which for those of you who remember the Java Puzzles, similar kind of idea, collect weird stuff, and, and I'm just the, the, the guardian, the librarian. Actually, it's all of you, it's the entire Scala community that collects these. My day job, if you like, I uh, work for Exo.ai and we magically schedule meetings, which is uh, incredibly awesome and it's artificial intelligence and amazing and bug Chris if you have any questions and I just you know, build infra stuff there and it's a lot of fun. Uh, now you get a picture with, with me, the real me. Um, and I am obviously the title of the talk, or the title of the workshop is not just uh, essential and accidental complexity in Scala, but it's also in Scala and Dotty. And I have the enormously grand total of zero Dotty commits to my name. So I thought I'm probably not best placed to talk uh, in detail about Dotty. So I decided why don't we uh, see whether we can find somebody who actually can do that. And so uh, up you step Dimitri to introduce yourself and he'll be doing the, the Dotty part. So, greetings, everyone. I'm Dmitry Petrashko. I'm I was the first who joined Martin in his effort to make Dotty be a thing. I've been working on Dotty for last, I guess, already two years. And for last year, I've been working the optimizer part of Dotty and supervising other people working on Dotty. Before this, my background was coming from the Scala Blitz, which were both parallel and sequential collections, which were macro generated based on efforts of Eugene Burmako, and they were substantially faster. And we're trying, in the new optimizer, we're trying to make the results of eliminating all of the overheads, eliminating boxing, to be available to all the Scala code without prior modification. Okay, so, yeah, what is this talk all about? So, what is this talk all about? Well, I mean, it, I know it's in a workshop slot, and there is a bunch of uh, slide material, a bunch of code samples that we're going to uh, show, and, of course, you're, nobody will stop you from putting them in your REPL. It's not a kind of step-by-step -step walkthrough, so I think, if anything, it's going to be more of a, a discussion, and debate, but, uh, discussion and debate, but the purpose of this, really, I mean, Scala is, you know, we're all here, we, we use it, we have come from various different backgrounds, so we have various different contexts in which we approach the language. It has in lots of very, very flexible features and, and, and little things that you can do with the language. And not only does it have these kind of small nuggets, it, it's actually conceptually a very grand enterprise. It attempts to, to combine very powerful and, and often divergent ideas from the space of computer science and language design. And kind of the consequence of this effort, perhaps to some extent inevitably, certainly in the initial versions, is that you have lots of, you know, with great power comes great ability to shoot yourself in the foot which sort of looks a little bit like this. Um, just to get a bit of a sort of show of hands feel here, who, keep your hand up until, until it no longer applies. Who here is uh, programmed in Scala for more than six months? Uh, everyone, uh, a year, five years. Okay, so, uh, so the people with a whole bunch of experience and yeah, I'm not gonna go any on, that's, I think that's all we were, we were trying to get a feel for. So there's a bunch of really experienced developers here and I, I will, <laughs> hazard a guess that at some point or another, everybody here has either sat in the better of the two cases and looked at the compiler output and scratched their head and said, what, what? Why on earth is it doing that? And of course, the, the more problematic version of that statement is when you have a production behavior in your systems and you're going like, what? Why on earth is it doing that? Because that's typically a lot less fun. So. Today, I mean, those of you who know a standard puzzler's talk, it's like a, it's a movie theater thing, you know, we have some examples up, you get to guess which is the right one, and then, you know, we, we embarrass everyone by showing up what the real answer is, and that's not what we're here to do today, and we might kind of sneak the odd puzzler in here or there, but the main thing that we're going to try and do today is to learn from these, uh, from these experiences. So, 
is there any lesson we can draw from the fact that Scala as a language has a couple of areas in which it behaves somewhat differently than you might expect? Um, if we try to look at these areas that have come together over the years, are there any trends that we can recognize? Are there particular parts of the language or particular interactions that are especially prone to doing things that you don't expect? Um, and you know, what, if anything, does that say about the language? I mean, after all, it's notionally, it's, it's our language. It's obviously an effort that we're all kind of involved in, either as users or creators, or someone like Dimitri or gets a lot of influence over that kind of stuff. And I think, I mean, for me, part of the takeaway of this session is that we all think about what kind of a language we want. Um, and not just kind of accept it, okay, well, that, that's what it says, I'm just going to use it, I'll deal with the quirks, whatever. Like, language evolution design, just like a real language, is a, a collaborative process. And so I think, you know, part of it is, especially those who have comparison with different languages that come from other communities, you do this every day anyway. So let's think about, let's look at what we have here as an amazing tool, and let's figure out what we could conceptually maybe, or what we could conceive of as being maybe a little bit better as we go forward. So, so specifically, if we look at the examples that we're going to look at, the, the puzzles that we're going to look at, um, which ones are the result of, if you like, essential complexity in the language, and which are the result of sort of accidental complexity? And then more specifically, and I'll hand this over to Dimitri. Yeah, and the point is, I mean, Scala and Doughty is used by a huge community. Every time somebody trips up in his IDE and sees something behave strange, he spends a lot of time and he has a lot of pain, but then if it happens in production, it's a huge pain for an entire company in many cases. So we want to see if we can get rid out of, of some of these corner cases, if we can simplify the life, but it's important for us to maintain this as Scala. We want to make sure that the important parts of those features are actually there. We want to make sure that we're fixing the corner cases, we're fixing the bugs. We're not removing the features that you were relying on. So, yeah, I mean, I like, just go on. <laughs> yeah, the question is, well, if we were intending to fix puzzlers, does it mean that there will be no puzzlers left? Well, well, first of all, in reality, no. I mean, there needs to be a book about dotty puzzlers, which is a nice opportunity to renew it. But in reality, some of these puzzlers most of these puzzlers happen because of the features, which are helpful in many cases. But that's the feature interaction between multiple features which gives a birth to a puzzler. And we need these features to stay. Maybe we can improve error messages. Maybe we can remove some of the feature interaction, which doesn't help. So we'll be going now through some of the details of these puzzlers, trying to see what's essential and accidental in the complexity introduced by this puzzle. So yeah, but the, before I just throw this phrase out there, I'll do this sort of quick, two pieces of kind of quick introduction for those who don't have this. First of all, when we talk about a, a puzzler, it's not, oh, I've never seen this symbol before, like, what does this do? If you're a new developer, and we've all, the way we learn languages, we don't like learn them, okay, I'm going to read the spec for the language, and then I'm going to sit there and go, no, most of us learn kind of as we need it, like we read a tutorial here, we copy paste some code from Stack Overflow there, we sit with some friends and figure some stuff out. And I think that's, that's legitimate, like we're not, we're not there to study it as a science, we're there to use it as a tool. Um, and, and so our, our knowledge of languages is almost by definition incomplete, and, and that has some impact anyway about what you kind of expect about its behavior. But of course, let's paint the ideal picture first of all, uh, modulo what Dimitri just said about reality, we would of course like to have our cake and eat it too. Like we would like to be this kid. Like you know, this Scala, Scala cake, we want it to do all the stuff uh, that it can do and we want it to be totally predictable at the same time. So we want a language that is expressive, um, ideally elegant too, so you don't have too much boilerplate and stuff like that, but uh, it doesn't have any weirdness. And um, I mean, what I just said sort of motivates the statement that weird, the problem with weirdness is it doesn't just mean it always behaves the way it is kind of specified to, not just the letter of the law, but also the sort of the spirit of the law. Part of the problem about counterintuitive behavior is that it's about expectation of people. And Scala, maybe more so than other languages, because it draws together people from a sort of large diversity of programming backgrounds, people come at the language with somewhat different expectations of what legitimate or realistic behavior is. 
So you know you can have the same behavior of a, of the REPL or the compiler, and one person from a particular background can go like this doesn't make any sense whatsoever, and the other person can say this is exactly what I was expecting. So maybe the 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 reality is that it's a bit too much to ask for a language that has no counterintuitive uh, behavior whatsoever. Maybe if you know it's a sort of a Turing completeness thing, Turing completeness implies puzzlers in some sort of vague corollary. Um, but maybe it makes more sense if we start to think a little bit about, okay, there's complexity, uh, an inevitable price to pay based on, on what we're getting from this language. And I think Dimitri made an excellent point. It's, it's not so much that each uh, the individual features are complex, but of course, we, we bake the cake out of them. Like we take individual bits, we mix them together in programs in an enormously large number of ways, far bigger than the ability of a designer or even an enorm enormous property testing suite to kind of figure out. And the point is maybe it's, it's not so much about trying to design or create a language that is totally devoid of weirdness, but can we get rid of weirdness that is really stuff that we can clean up? You know, whether that's a gray areas, in the spec, whether that's quirks of the way a particular compiler happens to work, or like stuff that sounded like a good idea at the time, and now that we look back, you know, five, ten, whatever years later, after they were first specified, like maybe we don't need them anymore. Yeah, and the good ways to phrase it is to think about this as a budget of complexity in developers' head. You want the developer to actually do the business and develop the business logic that he has in mind. You don't want him to be required to keep all the details about specification of the language. You want the language to n help him in everyday job. And you definitely want, don't want the language to look like it did what you wanted it to do, but behave differently in production. Uh, in ma many cases, in, it is because not only a single feature has a huge complexity, but because we have multiple features and every of these features draws complexity and makes you be required to be aware of them all the time. We want to make you feel like you're playing safe, like these features empower you instead of limiting you and instead of you being afraid to use one more feature. So yeah, the, the, the sort of long and the short of that is that what we're basically going to try and look at now, and don't worry, we're done with like text on slides, soon it'll be code on slides. It's essential complexity, which is sort of counterintuitive behavior that is a perhaps almost inevitable result of stuff that you want to have, versus accidental complexity, which is kind of noise, right? Things that, nah, they just, the, the unforeseen interaction of parts, and I think uh, Dimitri coined a nice phrase, there's also obsolete complexity. So stuff that, you know, sort of goes from category A to category B over time. XML literals might have been a great idea. I mean, whether they're complexity or not is a different question, but stuff that seemed to be a good idea at the time when, when things were specified, obviously, as we learn and experience a language, things change, and we might decide that it doesn't really make much sense anymore. Yeah, and sometimes it's not just the target became obsolete. I mean, we don't need XML that much anymore. Sometimes we just invented a way to reach the same target better, which doesn't require specific language features. I'll be showing later one example of a language feature, which used to be a thing written in the, in the specification of the language, which compilers need to be aware of. But now it can be just be implemented as a library functionality. We'll get to it later. So now the, now the science bit, like, seriously, data science. Like now we get all the like the current. No, no, this is not. This is sort of semi-science. I'm not going to call it pseudoscience because we didn't consult astrologers or something to do this. But this is this is more kind of like hand wavy ish science. So we did a sort of cluster analysis. Uh, we looked at there's about 67 or so puzzles out there right now. This is slightly older, and we tried to group them. Um, and uh, caveat, um, so it's tricky to assign uh, puzzlers, a lot of puzzlers to one particular category because almost by their nature, they result from the interaction of a few different categories. So we've, you know, there's, the numbers are a little hand wavy. That's partially the reason why they don't add up to 100. Uh, the other is that I'm really bad at copying, pasting, and rounding at the same time. Um, so the, the puzzlers that we've come up with, let me just zoom through these quickly. Well, actually, let's go back one step. So there's object orientation. Um, classic sort of theoretical OO, we know Scala, very clear design goal, wants to be a fusion of these, so it has, as we would imagine, first class support for objects, and that comes with some weirdness that we will look at. Um, beyond sort of purely theoretical OO, of course we know that Scala was designed, uh, especially at the beginning, to be very, very JVM friendly, and also, well, JVM friendly, it ran on the JVM, it still does, also very Java friendly. Um, we all remember Rod Johnson's famous keynote, 
um, all that kind of stuff. So this idea that it should be really easy to interact with existing programs to do a little bit of Scala in this enormous mountain of spaghetti Java code that we all have. Uh, and so certain concessions or certain decisions were made to enable that and, and they also have a, a kind of impact. Um, the other part of the, the OO, you know, the, the, the Scala spectrum of course, is it's not just an OO language, it also tries to be a first class functional language and that means that, well it took Java, what, 10 years and, and, and three versions of, of nothing to, to sort of catch up with this a little bit. We have first class functions uh, and we have first class function application and partial application and all the kind of things that come with that. And that also results in a, in a bunch of interesting facts, especially when you try to jam that obviously into an underlying platform that doesn't really or didn't have support for those particular concepts. Uh, Scala has a very powerful type inference uh, machine um, and, and logic and all these kind of things. And uh, yeah, there are some decisions I think and implementation quirks made there that, that have some impact. And then it also tries to be a very elegant language, you know, semicolons be gone, um, braces be gone in many places, like don't write too much stuff. There's a, a clear, I think, sort of trend there to try to make a language very elegant and simple. And in some cases, and I think this is a very interesting case because a, a small change comparatively in, from Scala to Dotty has a huge impact in this particular area, um, has a lot of impact in terms of kind of complexity and weirdness. There's another bunch of complexity associated with the Scala collections that are kind of out of scope for this discussion because A, we would have a whole conference dedicated to Scala collection puzzlers, which would kind of be a little boring, and B, it's an ongoing topic of redesign and so on, and it's not really core core to the language. I mean, it's the standard library essentially, but it's not the, the, the kernel of the language itself. So if you want to see some of those, just come bug me afterwards. I can, I can bore you forever, um, but we're going to skip these kind of for now. And with that, let's look at some code. Right, so this is uh, uh, the first kind of code example. Um, quick show of hands here, who knows the Scala puzzle side of the book or something like that? Uh, about half. So there's a bunch of you who don't. So I'll go maybe a bit more slowly than, um, than, than I might and we'll see how the time goes. We don't have to do all these, of course. This is a classic uh, piece of, of Scala example code. In fact, it was the, for, for many years, it was the single entry in Paul Phillips's Scala FAQ and it's now disappeared. But there is ongoing discussion about that, ongoing questions. I think there's a Scala Lang thread about this right now. Um, spoiler alert, lots of spoilers coming up here. The, the, the trick about, so first of all, the, the code structure, there's really nothing very special happening here. It's a classic piece of OO programming. You have a, a, a base trait, in this case A, and you declare a couple of uh, variables there, a couple of members. One is abstract, the other isn't. Um, and then you uh, specify the abstract one in the first child class, and then in the, the next child class, you override the other one. And then you print the values of each of these of the two members at different stages in the initialization process um, for uh, a new instance of C. And uh, those of you who want to try it, do, by all means. Um, we've tested most of these just before the talk. They still, you put them in a REPL, they'll still go weird. Um, the weird thing about this one is uh, mainly the fact that uh, the assignment of 10 to the value bar basically never happens. Um, so anybody who expects that to have any kind of effect, you'll get fooled that first println statement in A will print bar equals zero. And the, uh, ooh, is that weird? You all aware of this? So uh, most people, I mean, the more experienced you are as a Scala developer, the bigger your chance of looking at one of these code examples. Yeah, yeah, I know this. But this is because you've become immune. It's like an immune system to sort of weirdness in a language. Like you develop that over time. We, part of the other thing is, you know, we know Scala, for, for people, we, we saw, we saw Bodil's video, for people coming to the language new, it's also interesting to think about what is that experience if you haven't developed this kind of immunity. I'll let Dimitri talk about why exactly this happened. So the main reason why this happens is because when we're compiling to Hotspot, when we're compiling to GVM, traits, which are interfaces, don't have fields. And we'll need to implement them using the stuff we have in classes. So they actually the field will only be created in the first class, which is inherited, which is B. And then we'll need to create trait getters and trait setters. And only then it will call the method. It means that the happens before here is actually different. It, traits are actually working differently from classes. I'll, I'll explain later whether there are alternatives here, but the point is this feature and this interaction comes from us trying to allow you to do all the same things which you can do in classes and traits. And sometimes it leaks. 
Yeah, and, and of course the, the point is in C you do see 99, that's the assignment that happens, but you can't as initialize that value twice. Uh, and, and so one of the initializations doesn't happen and the compiler doesn't actually tell you and that arguably um, could be improved and as Dimitri said there, there's more to be discussed about what could be done better here. Suffice it to say that part of this is almost inevitable if you want to take some of the design goals as we want to run on the JVM and we want to support inheritance. Like it's not really necessarily well. Uh, potentially, but some of this kind of weirdness will, will exist in the language, uh, resulting in sort of initialization quirks. Um, here's another one we all heard Martin say, um, you know, overloading is the worst thing for any compiler designer, so we could do him a favor and just get rid of overloading, but maybe that's a little bit challenging. So, quick walk through this one, what's happening here, uh, so we have a, an object and it has two pairs of overloaded methods, overload A and overload B. Um, the difference between the two is that one of the pairs has uh, one and two arguments respectively and the second one in both variants they have one, they take one parameter. Um, and then we try to invoke both of these uh, pairs respectively and irrespective of what you think the example actually does, uh, I would guess naively or intuitively we would all expect the result to be the same. Like either it doesn't compile or it compiles and if it compiles it picks the same version or whatever. Or does somebody think it's natural that they would behave differently? Ah, that's why it's a puzzler. Yeah, no, uh, so what happens here, so this is a kind of interesting one. Um, one, I think, perfectly reasonable answer would be it doesn't compile because uh, 99 is neither a unit nor nothing. Um, but it does compile because those of you, you know, a lot of us have worked with Scala know that Scala can treat pretty much anything as a unit when it needs to. It's called, uh, uh, it's an implicit, uh, implicit conversion called, uh, I think, value discarding, if I remember correctly. And um, the interesting thing here is that value discarding can't be applied straight away. Uh, value discarding can only be applied when the compiler knows what it wants and what it has, and if it wants a unit and has something else, it can do it. But of course, before you've done overload resolution, the compiler doesn't actually know what it wants because it doesn't know which overloaded version you're going to call. Um, so what happens in the second case is that the compiler can't decide. It can't figure out whether you want to call the first one or the second one, and uh, it says, well, I'm sorry, uh, it won't compile. Um, and in the first version, you get into an interesting kind of it's spec. It's described this way in the spec, but that was a spec change in a particular version of Scala. So I don't know when it, remember exactly when it happened, but before that, it would have behaved differently. As an optimization, I gather, Dimitri can probably correct me, before trying to figure out which types match, Scala does something called shape matching in overloading resolution. So it looks at the number of arguments that you have and the number of arguments that the various overloaded methods offer. So in this particular case, you have one argument and there's only one version that requires one parameter. So it says, well, it's got to be the first version. There's no way we can make it work with the second version. Actually, I've just come up with a question for myself. I'm not quite sure how that works with auto-tupling. We'll get to that later. Um, and then it, it picks the first version already based purely on the shape and then it looks at the type and says, well, wait a minute, I've got a problem. I've got an, uh, I've got an int, but I want a unit. Oh, good, I can do it. I can fix it. And so this first, the first call to overload A compiles and the second one doesn't. And I think that's kind of weird, right? I mean, that's not intuitive and even the reason for it is not something where you would say, oh, well, obviously, because clearly if you did the type logic, you could probably figure out that even in the second case, only the first one is an applicable candidate and then you should be able to pick it. So I think this is an example of potentially some sort of accidental complexity. Like you would expect this to be able to work, but maybe I'm wrong. So in practice, the reason here is that if you are actually going to infer a lot of type parameters, so if the methods actually had type parameters, there will be a lot bigger space that you'll be exploring. And the thing which does shape analysis and cause number of arguments allows us to limit the space and in more complex examples, like Scala collections themselves, this is needed strictly needed to be able to create wonderful APIs. We're trying to fix a more complex example, but it leaks in simple examples here. So though in this example it is accidental complexity, it comes from the part that in more complex examples, which have to do with implicit, with, with implicit and type inference, this is actually required. And because the language needs to be consistent between both easy and complex examples, it shows up here. And, and uh, 
rather than just throwing a stupid example out there, I mean, I guess what this clearly means is that things like re relying on value discarding are not great. Like if you were to write some kind of code like this, and I mean, the, the reason this is kind of tricky is because this can bite you after the fact, like something that compiled originally can suddenly no longer compile if somebody adds another overloaded method, right? And that's when it goes weird, like, because you know, if in the bottom case, overload B, if I don't have the nothing version, everything will compile just fine because there's only one candidate. And then somebody adds the overload B of nothing, which, you know, why should it possibly interfere? It doesn't apply in that case, and suddenly things don't compile anymore. So basically try to avoid, I guess, these kind of like implicit type conversions. If you're calling an overloaded method, call the, make sure you call the type that you want. Yeah. And there's actually the third type in the schema. So in both Scala and C dotted, there are several types which in many situations act as if they were bottom types. By bottom type, I mean every particular value, every particular expression can somehow be of this type. One is obviously nothing. Nothing is a real bottom type. The other is unit, where you, you, we can convert anything to unit just by discarding the value. And the third one is null. That's tr true only for stuff which extends any ref. But you make this, can make this example even harder by creating the third overload, which will then sometimes work for, which will then create a method which can work for primitives but cannot work for objects. And whether you observe something as a primitive or not can also depend on the context. Which we will, uh, which we will see, I think, right now. <laughs> what, a, what a coincidence. We didn't even practice that. Pretty amazing. So this is a fun one. And it's kind of a, it's a mix of various things. It's like a mix of uh, well, inheritance to some extent. And then, of course, the fact that we are actually running on the JVM and that we have a, a parent type that doesn't have a natural correspondence. Um, and uh, Dimitri will, I think, say a bit more about this. So what happens here? So uh, we declare a, a class, and it has a type member x, and it has a variable. Now, clearly none of us would ever write this because it has a variable, right? So this example is like out of most people's life. No, I'm joking. Um, for performance, we would create a variable, and we initialize the variable with its default value. So that's what the under one of the 15 uses that Josh was mentioning of the underscore. That's what it does here. It means give it the default value. Um, but we never use it sort of directly here. We then create a, a subtype, uh, a subclass of, of A, and we specialize X to be int. And then we make a new B. Um, in this case, it will infer the type to be B. So B here is of type B. And then we print the value of X. Um, those of you who have a REPL or have got a laptop open, you might want to try it. What do you think that prints? Shout out an answer. Come on, someone. Oh, don't be shy. I'm not telling your boss. Maybe he's sitting in the room. Then it's a problem. Okay, I'll tell you, it prints null, right? Even though x is an int here, uh, which is kind of fun. Um, but in the next line, if you assign it to a val and then print it again, you get zero. Um, and irrespective of how you would imagine these things to behave, I'm pretty sure you would expect them to behave the same way, like weird or not. Um, and so what's going on under the hood here is actually pretty interesting and fundamental. And um, Yeah, so there, there's an interaction of two features here. First one is that when we introduce in any time the common supertype between primitives and object, this type doesn't actually have a representation on the hotspot. And because of this, we needed to encode it somehow, which meant that we encode it as an object, which is the only thing which exists in hotspot, which can express both primitives and an object, but then primitives will be boxed. Which means that inside superclass A, the field X will have type of object, and the default vault value for object type is null. But when we observe it as an integer, it would mean that we may be observing a default value of integer as null, which means that in entire Scala, which can be seen in this example better, uh, when you actually have a null and you try to unbox it into an integer, or it will be in the next example, uh, when you have a null anywhere and you try to unbox it to a primitive type, it, it has to be the default value and nothing else. Unlike this in Java, if you try to unbox null, it throws null pointer exception. Because null can never be in the same location as an integer or a double or a float. The other thing here which happens is overload resolution. So in the first example, when you get x, your expected type is object. So you're actually asking for something which is already boxed. And it knows that it has a gatherer, which already returns the boxed value, which is defined in super type. So it can actually so save on boxing, unboxing, and just get it directly. 
So basically, while, yeah, sorry, go on. Yeah, while in the second example, the local value that you introduce, you want it to have the most precise type because you'll be using it down the road. It will be an integer. You will actually unbox the null in this line and get the zero. The null doesn't originate from the class. It originates from unboxing here. That if you unbox null, you get zero. Yeah, and then the, so the reason, I mean, the println is, is key to this kind of puzzling thing happening. If you try to pass b.x into anything that accepts an int, or anything that will trigger type inference of that field, then it will look up as it show up as a zero. But as Dimitri was saying, because println accepts any, you don't, you don't need to bother, right? You just shove it in there. If I use a type description there and I go b.x colon int, for instance, it'll show up as a, as a zero as I'm expecting. Um, so yeah, and this is, this is totally spec compliant. Like we're not, there's not even a bug. This is legitimately, so who thought that you could get a null in an int or any, any val legitimately in Scala? Oh, well, some people know they've done this too much. Okay, so we got to know it from production code. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and so yes, there's a there's a variant of this. Yeah, and this is a variant which shows that you can actually have this even without printlin. You just need something which will lose precision. So you have a b, which is the same for as previous example. You just define that you have a field which is integer, but the superclass didn't know that this is an integer. And now, if you observe it from the superclass, the only thing which happens here is widening you actually never need to insert boxing because it, well, you don't know that you're working on integers once again. So every time you observe some of superclass, there, is, there may be a lot of information missing which will introduce the behavior which is unexpected if you go back to Java. Printlin here becomes from, comes from Java point of view. As soon as you lose generics in Scala, you can have unexpected behavior. And of course the fix for this, I mean the thing to do, don't use default initialization of unknown types um, in parent classes like this, right? So you can easily fix this example by making x a def or an abstract and, and then initializing it in b where the type is known and then it will show up the way you expect it to show up. But yeah, so this is, you know, this is an interesting sort of confluence of both inheritance and the fact that we're running on the JVM and there is an, an, a mismatch in between some of the concepts that exist in Scala and some of the concepts of the underlying implementation. And why is this interesting? Well, this is interesting not just because Scala does indeed run on the JVM. It's also interesting because, of course, there's more and more discussion around Scala potentially running on other runtimes. I mean, there's more interesting and, and fundamental examples that have a bigger impact. But, yeah, clearly, if you're trying to comp compile Scala down to JavaScript or you're trying to compile Scala down to native code with LLVM or whatever, well, how is it, you know, how is it supposed to behave? Do we kind of mirror this kind of weirdness or do we fix it or whatever? And, and these are all really new projects and anybody who's out there thinking of using them, this is really something that I think we can all contribute to and have an opinion about. So this is a, this is a more evil or it, it's a version that looks uglier, right? From, from the perspective of a pure or clean Scala developer because there's Java involved and there's Java types. Ugh. But of course, if we go back to one of the motivating factors of Scala, one of the big design goals was make it easy to interoperate with Java libraries. And so this is an example of how that might happen. You call arbitrary, you know, Rod Johnson, you follow his advice, you call hibernate or whatever, and you get some ugly Java junk back, right? So you get, in this case, a, a hash map of string to integer. And you know, of course, integer isn't an int. So what are you going to do? You're going to like move Java lang integer all the way throughout your code just because you get it back from Java? No, probably not you're probably going to try and convert it to, to legitimate Scala types as soon as you possibly can. And we have a bunch of really nice helper methods to do this. And we can either do it explicitly or implicitly or whatever. Um, and so then we end up at, at the position where we uh, compare an, an entry in this particular map to null. And then to zero. And again, um, I mean, given, well, you now, you've, you've heard a lot of explanation that will probably give you a better idea for what the answer actually is. But naively speaking, whatever you think these comparisons are, you wouldn't expect them both to be true. Because then you're proving that null equals zero, you would, might think, and that would be really strange, wouldn't it? But if you run this code, not only will they both print true, more funnily enough, the first one will actually warn and say, comparing uh, an, int an int to null can never be true, and then it is true after all. Yeah, the point is that your assumption that int and null cannot be equal is actually false. Because, once again, null is a default value of all the types, in our case including primitives. And actually, in this example, if, in, if you go away from the integer type, you're going to have a funny situation where the same code in Java and Scala runs differently, 
because in our case equality is different. Let's say in Java, if you're looking inside a let's say hash map, which contains byte one, and you're looking for integer one, they're different. They're different classes. They don't compare to each other. While in Scala, we're trying to make your life easier, but saying that well one is one, independently how you represent it. We have some something called cooperative equality, which makes you not think about what is a representation of one and hides it away from you. But if you have interaction with Java, this can leak back and introduce funny situations where in Scala you've put a value and you expect it to be there, but then when you look at it from Java, it's not there or reverse. Uh, yeah, I, 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 that was a new one for me and that sounds incredibly scary, but anyway. Ugh. So here's another nice one, and this is very JVM specific. Um, uh, and it's also it, it kind of very easy to get different behavior out of this because it relies on a very uh, very well specified but a very kind of specific fact about how the JVM does class initialization. So what's happening here? Well, first of all, we declare an object, and um, there's two objects inside there, and they basically point to each other. So x dot value points to y dot value, and vice versa. And what we do then is we trigger initialization of these values by randomly deciding to initialize either one or the other. And you, know, you, you, well, you might imagine a whole bunch of things. You might imagine that you know, one is always going to be one and the other is going to be two. And that's why if you randomly pick one or the other, you might sometimes get one, you might sometimes get two or whatever. Uh, what actually happens in this case, um, well, the other obvious, uh, maybe uh, intuitive idea is that this can't work. Like either it should fail to compile because you have a cycle uh, which would hopefully be sane, but difficult to detect maybe, I guess, in more complex examples. This is a trivial example. Think complex dependency graphs of applications where you have like 10 or 15 or 20 objects that you're wiring up and you have repositories pointing to managers and whatever you have. And eventually it's actually not too difficult to get into a cycle. Um, so what happens here, it could also endless loop, for instance. You could try it and the first one will try to initialize the other one, which tried to initialize blah, blah, blah. And if you use lazy valves, that's actually what happens. Um, but in, on, in Scala C, since you're running on the JVM, and since these are objects, and the way they're implemented is it turns into class initialization on the JVM. And class initialization on the JVM is re-entrant. So you are trying to initialize an object that tries to initialize you. You can try to re-initialize it again, and it will not deadlock, because what it'll do is say, wait a minute, you're already trying this, this can never work. I'll give you back the default values. So that's in the JLS. It's really, really down there. It's not anywhere in the Scala language spec, obviously. It's just part of the JVM spec. And so that means that the first caller gets the value zero for the other one. And then the second one turns out to be one. So if you print this, you always get one because the first one always gets one. And this happens because for top level classes, we want top level objects to be static members as in Java for compatibility with Java for performance reasons. If you try to actually nest this object, they will implement. Well, they will be implemented as lazy vals. That's what spec says. And in case of lazy vals, the Scala spec says differently. If you call a lazy val, you should never be able to observe an initialized value. You should always get the value which is the value of lazy val. If it's not initialized, you're trying to run the, run the initialization code. And this means that you'll actually get this stack overflow or infinite cycle. So, and yeah, if you're not running, if you come, I have no idea, I haven't tried this recently on Scala.js or whatever. If you try to run this on another backend, you will get different behavior most likely. So there's some, and, and, and it also shows, in fact, I didn't know that, it's not just about objects and lazy valves not being exactly the same, even though the spec kind of intuitively says that you can think about them as being roughly the same. It's actually also where those objects are that makes a difference, which, which, which is, uh, yeah, a lot of stuff leaking through here. Look at the time. Now we, you know, okay, so now we get into type inference. Incredibly contrived example. This is actually a mix. This is sort of halfway between type inference and functional style. So one of the things about obviously working in a language that has first class functions is that you have to be able to represent functions really easily because you do it all the time. And I certainly remember, and I still do this to a large extent, I regard functions as being, uh, you know, the curly braces versus the parentheses is really just a matter of personal preference or where they happen to appear in the code, what looks nicer, I really regard them as equivalent. So there's some weirdness going on here. Obviously, we have a, a type that has the same, uh, that looks the same as the same uh, name, I guess, as a, as a value, as a constant, and so on and so forth. 
But again, no matter what you think these two lines do at the bottom, you would probably expect them to do the same thing. And they don't. And the reason they don't, which is kind of interesting, is that one of these versions, in one of the versions, if you want to uh, add a type ascription to the parameter of a function, you can just put it there. And in the other version, you need to add parens around it. So in one of these versions, it, it regards the function as being, you know, a is a function that takes an integer and returns dollar, the constant. And the other one, it says a, a is a function from into dollar. That's true because it's a list of dollar, which is a function from into dollar. So one of them is actually a map a, maps it to itself. And the other one is a map of a constant function that takes an int to the value one. And so you run it and then look at the example on the site to, to see more details. I mean, this is not so much, uh, this is a contrived example, obviously, but it's again supposed to expose the fact that, you know, things that you might intuitively think of the same and you would probably hope also from a, a usage perspective that they should behave the same, don't actually. So for me, this is probably an example that's more on the accidental than on the, there's probably a good reason in the parser why you need parens in one case, but not in the other. But from a user's perspective, that's something that's kind of really hard and weird to remember, especially if you're told that they're kind of equivalent. Yeah, all right, nothing to say there. Okay, so this is one, again, we've all seen, actually, I think we missed one, some of the list to set one, doesn't matter. Oh, yes, oh yeah, I have to, well, doesn't matter. Well, we might, let's get, should we go back to it? I think we can, it won't take too long. Da, da, da. Where was it? it was before here, wasn't it? Was it here? I can't remember. It was in the introduction. Oh, it was in the introduction, oh, so far away, and I forgot it. You actually warned me about this, didn't you? And I still failed. Ah, what a pity. Uh, oh, here, yeah, so we, we ah, oh, ha, the favorite, you all know this. Uh, yes, so this is probably the, one of the most well-known and most studied puzzles, and I hope everybody's developed some kind of immunity to this. This is the famous one where you call 2set or 2c or whatever, and instead of uh, leaving the parens off, which is what you're supposed to do, you put the parens there because you remember it looks like Java or whatever, and then you get false instead of a set. And then that even compiles because you can actually concatenate anything with anything else because that's the JVM shining through. So this is like the, the mother of all puzzles to some extent because it, it combines all these categories, right? There's Java interaction in multiple senses. There's conciseness. Uh, there's type inference, which we're getting back to and so on. So hopefully everybody has seen this example. And if you haven't put it in a REPL, just convince yourself that it's as weird as it actually is. And now if we zoom forward all the way to a slightly more realistic version, well, that's actually very realistic, unfortunately, but a version that focuses more on this particular example. Um, we all use... I need to string add. Is that gonna it's be not the Java feature. Huh? No, that's not the Java feature, no, but I think no, if I remember... It was is that going to be in .dotic? Well, so .dotic has its own pre-dev, which doesn't have it. But the point is, some of the code relies on it. Yeah. So assumption is we need a migration pass. There is intention to remove it, oh, I heard that. but I mean, as an always an implicit, it starts with deprecating it. Okay. So uh, just to, for those of you that do, who knows any to string add? I think most of you probably do. So uh, yeah, any to string add is uh, an implicit that to en enable this ability to basically concatenate a str anything with the string, which is behavior the way we know from Java, allows you to implicitly convert anything to a string by calling to string on it, I guess, that's the default implementation. That's in pre-def, so it's not baked into the language, but it is imported by default, and you can actually switch it off, which is a good thing to know. Like, you can actually unimport a particular member of pre-def by mapping it to underscore in the import, and that's very useful if you don't like this particular feature. Admittedly, it's a bit of a complicated opt-out scheme, and as Dimitri was saying, we see it in lots of parts of code, but. Anyway, it's good to know that you can get rid of it in any case. And, so and if you want to see what parts are actually Scala language and which parts are standard library, there is a compiler option which unimports the entire pre-dev. It may be an interesting amusement to try to write code if you don't have actually any library support coming. So this one, no, we, I, we long, let's get back to this one. This one is about the, a specific part of the weird two-set puzzle, which is about type widening. So type widening is, I think, the bane of a lot of uh, weird sort of like, oh, it, it crashes at runtime, or why on earth did that even compile? And as far as I know, it was obviously a very explicit design choice to do also with the covariance and contravariance that you can treat certain things 
the way you would expect. But the, what's wrong here? Well, the fact is that we're doing a zip operation which returns a list of tuples, tuples, um, and then we're calling get or else on it, and we're, uh, as a default value, we're retrieving something that's not a tuple, not a tuple. And that's probably not what we wanted to do, because typically the recovery value is of the same type or is at least usable in the same way as the thing that we're getting from. And this applies to get or else, it applies to recover with, it applies to a lot of uh, containers or monads that have this kind of escape functionality. And of course, what will happen here is it'll compile. Um, it won't compile if you are more explicit about the type that you want. But again, you know, from a conciseness perspective, why put the types everywhere? Because the compiler will help you with this. And X dot Y will blow up with a match error because you can't obviously match 10 against uh, the pair X, Y. Yeah, so this is an interaction between two features. One is type inference, that you can actually combine any two types in Scala and get a decent lab. And the pattern matching, because the val syntax here, the assignment, is actually a shortcut, short syntax for doing pattern matching, which by default can fail. And one of the easy ways to fix it is the one which is in Dory, that when you lob two types, you, don't, you actually get an OR type. So if you have something which returns you know, one case class or another case class, you don't get product with serializable. You get one case class or other case class. So, I mean, and again, in reality, this usually fails at compile time rather than at runtime because obviously you try to use this pair somewhere. You try to call, like, you know, oh, actually, no, here you're already assigning it, so this would probably even fail at runtime. But in other cases where you're assigning it to a value directly without doing the pattern matching and you expect it to be a tuple, at some point you try to call underscore one on it or whatever, and that will fail to compile because actually what the compiler is returning here is, is any, I think, in this case, or product with serializable in so many other cases. Is that there should be like an abbreviation for that because it's so frequent, like P, P, W, S or something like that. I don't know. Um, here's another one. So here's another, uh, now we're moving over into the sort of conciseness. I like, obviously, Scala's conciseness and all, having worked a lot in many more verbose languages. Um, but yes, it does come at a cost, and, and let me speed up here a little bit. So let me go through this quite quickly um, and, and give away the, 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 the solution. Um, basically, what you might think is, so this is a, a, a value class. It adds a pad2 method to string builder which allows you to say, like, I want it to be 15 characters long or whatever, and then you think what it does is it says, okay, how many spaces am I missing? Um, and then I'm just going to call append on the string builder so many times to, to get the string of the length that I want. Um, and I think it's natural to think about this, especially when you come from an imperative background, because for each looks nice and imperative, and you're sort of used to thinking of the thing that goes inside for each as just an expression. It just, you know, that's what's going to be in, uh, invoked all the time. But of course it's not. The thing that you pass for each is actually a function. Typically it's a function that just does stuff. Um, and it does what you expect there. But you, know, you could write this as an explicit function, like underscore, uh, arrow, or rocket, uh, sp append. And that's actually the way to fix this puzzler. But why do that? You know, you're not using the parameter. It's a function anyway. It compiles. Just leave it off. But you get weird behavior. Because what happens here is that sp.append uh, star is a function in its own right. So that gets executed once, that line, or that short expression, when that line is compiled. And it returns a string builder, a string builder that has one extra star. Um, and string builder has an apply. So what you're actually calling here is a certain number of times you're calling apply, which on the string builder is car at a particular index. And that'll work if you're really lucky if the string builder is long enough. And if it's not long enough, as in the second case, it goes bang because eventually you're basically calling string builder dot car at twenty five on a twenty four character string or whatever, and it goes bang. And so you get a weird interaction here between you know the way you're used to thinking of for each, which is a sort of imperative block of code, um, and the fact that you, you're getting used to not writing functions explicitly if you don't need them, and so on and so forth. Right, so yeah, that's a, that's, that's a kind of fun one. Um, let's just move on to the next one. Ah, yeah, so this is a, a, an even more weird version. I'm very glad to say, but Dimitri can talk much more about that later, that an entire universe of puzzles, we obviously did a comparison. A lot of them die. A lot of them stay for, for many reasons we'll discuss, but quite a few of them die, and a lot of them are related to this problem, um, or this feature of Scala that Dottie doesn't have anymore. And it's a really small change, and it makes a pretty big difference. Um, implicit search and what is in scope for implicit search. 
So what happens here, again, you would imagine can't possibly be any different. Like we have implicitly they look the same one, we've done the nice thing and we've dropped the type, but it's really the same type, it is string to int. And then we just call both of them and one of them does what you would expect it to do, it prints, I don't know whether it prints, it prints uh, two, and the other one um, blows up uh, with a, a endless loop. And the reason it does that is because two int doesn't actually exist on a string. And normally that works in Scala because there's a nice implicit called, you know, I think it's into string ops or something like string to string ops rather, which adds string ops, you know, wraps a string in string ops. And that's what actually happens in the first case. And in the second case, uh, a problem occurs because um, int also has a two int method. You can call 5.2int. It doesn't do much, but it exists. And so you have this underscore here, uh, which is a string. And you need to convert it to something that has a to int method. And Scala looks at all the implicits that it has in scope, and it goes, oh, look, there's one called string to int. Oh, why don't we use that? So it uses itself. So what you end up with, you end up with uh, string to int underscore dot to int, which, of course, ends in an endless loop because you just end up calling yourself. And that doesn't work in the first case because it doesn't know the type yet. In the first case, the implicit isn't available because it doesn't know that the implicit actually returns an int because it's still busy trying to figure out what the implicit actually does. So what, should, what this example shows is that given the current schema where you can have type of implicits inferred implicitly and not provided explicitly, depending in which order you'll be inferring them, you may either know them already or not, and they may either apply or not. So there is a one small change in Dotty, which requires all implicits to have type provided explicitly. And it destroys an entire uh, section of puzzlers, and it can be perfectly migrated with a migration tool. Just a migration tool will insert you the type of implicits that you wrote. But yeah, so think about it. Good practice in this case, actually be explicit about the type. It's good practice for the future, even if you get a tool to do it. Like, don't rely. Oh, or don't rely on the fact, and there's, there's many different flavors of this, don't rely on the fact that the compiler doesn't actually yet know what an implicit, what the type of an implicit is, is while it's trying to figure it out. Um, I'll zoom through this one quickly, I think, because we have more interesting stuff to go to. So this is another sort of example. It's a little bit of a conciseness and a little bit of, of functional stuff as well. Clearly in a language that has um, functions as a first class citizen, you need to be able to uh, partially apply functions and then move the result around and capture it and so on. And Scala has two schemes for this, has partial application, um, and well, which is basically just a, a, a nice convenient way of creating an anonymous function. And it has eta expansion, which is a somewhat more involved way of actually taking a, a method call and converting it to a function type. And they look really similar. So here's that conciseness choice again, like, ah, you know, the first one, the longhand form of that is to go like n, rocket add counter n and like oh why do we do that no it's not very nice we have this magic character that can mean anything it's called underscore let's just put it there and so they look really really similar but they actually behave quite differently in many different ways ways uh, they behave differently in respect to the way they treat var args for instance which is a particularly weird case um, but they also behave differently in terms of whether they capture arguments eagerly or not so the essence to this one essentially is that the, the version with a partial application um, becomes an anonymous function, s, rocket, add, counter, s. And counter is the reference stays. So it's evaluated at the moment that the function is invoked, which is probably what you would think. When you eta expand uh, add counter in, in for to, to create adder2, it captures the value of counter at that point. So it fixes it. And that means that irrespective of what the value of counter, of counter is later on, when you invoke adder2, you get the value that it was when adder2 was created. So through two, two and it, what's especially weird about this is weird, what can be confusing about it is that they look similar. If they didn't look so similar, I think it would be more natural to think that they're probably not going to behave the same way. But the more similar I think things look, and the more often you see them used in examples in sort of almost interchangeable ways, obviously the, the bigger the chance that you think they're kind of the same. Now I have to be nervous. I see Martin. Okay. What I say. Right. Now I can. Now I can learn. I'm gonna sit down. The point is, you are shown now a huge amount of puzzlers, which are scary. They're even more scary once again if you see them in production, because let's say the previous puzzler, 
the types are the same. You will never see the type error here, but it behaves differently. So, well, puzzlers are Pandora boxes, and they weren't there intentionally. They are mostly the result of taking two boxes, putting one to another, and then they somehow react with each other, and you open it and there is a devil going out of it. Uh, newcomers mostly are afraid of these devils. You learn to create the immunity from them by knowing not to go into pitfalls, but it hurts newcomers, and then they think that Scully is too complex. Uh, the thing is, a lot of people have used these boxes in practice for convenience, or just because they love them, or because they enjoy them, or because they happen to write this code, they happen to introduce a bug and rely on it being there. They happen to build entire system over some funny interaction of the features, and they have other mechanisms to compensate for the bug. And if we remove the bug, the mechanism will somehow shoot back. So the thing is, we want to close the boxes, but every time we close this, we remove such Heisen bug or a puzzler, we need to consider how hard it would be to migrate existing code. There is a code there which may rely on this bug, there is a code there which may just want this feature to be in. And we want to make sure that we're not hurting people that are using features in the way which is useful. So to give one example, one of the features which all compiler developers want to get rid of once again is overloading. Overloading means that you can't rely on the names. The name doesn't say what it is. There may be multiple things which have the same name and you need to do some overload resolution, type inference, shape analysis to decide what name you're actually referring to. And in some cases, it may be ambiguous even after. So all compiler developers and most compiler courses work without presence of overloading because it's easier. It's a lot of problems which are ridiculously hard in presence of overloading become trivial. But developers love this. We also love this. We use this inside compiler. And this feature is to stay because it's very helpful. We are up to task to having the pain of living with overloading as compiler developers to make sure that d developers in industry can live with this feature and enjoy it and make their API simpler. Uh, so, but going back to once again, classification of the puzzlers, puzzles affect multiple things and there'd be multiple reasons for you to remove the puzzler. One of the puzzlers, puzzlers affect type system. They make you infer the types you didn't expect. They make the code run later that the way you didn't expect. The code may do the thing that you wanted, but be very slow. It may have really bad performance. Or it can introduce memory leaks that you didn't expect. It may run in a way which is entirely unpredictable because of initialization issues. You may be able to observe separate different values depending on how the classes are written. I'll show it to you later and we will see several features and several uh, puzzlers in all these areas and see whether we can do something with the Dolly. So one of the features about type checking and type inference is type projections. So type projection has been in Scala for a long time and only recently we got to know that type projection is actually unsound. You can write a simple examples of code which are able to prove everything, which are able to prove that integer is a string. And as long as we have type projection in the type system, you can't rely on the types. You can't believe anything that you write, more or less. Uh, it's harder to write this in Scala because you need a lot of code, but given the fact that in Dota we have wonderful syntax, this is an example of code which proves that integer is a string. The same code can be written with Scala C, but it will take just a lot more place because you don't have real OR types, but you can still try to infer them. But the point is, until we have type projection, we can't trust the types. Type projection is widely used. We can't just remove it. We need to have a migration path. It means the Doty still supports type projection in the compatibility mode with Scala 2, but we intend to help users migrate away from it because it introduces bugs. It, if you're using, for example, implicit evidences to prove something, null proves everything. And it's entirely unsound as long as you have type projection and null. For null, we have a sol solution in mind with OR types. For type projection, the problem comes from the fact 
that there is no good definition of what it is in the first place. We weren't able to come with a sound definition and the people who know it more or less better are the two people in the world. So it's not impossible to maintain it. Uh, another example of the feature, which is the feature that we're considering removing, is structural types. It's very easy to write a type like this. In many cases, you didn't in even intend to write the type, structural type. You thought you, that you were writing some kind of type refinement because it's easy. And the, what actually happens in, is these two lines compile in a lot of reflection code. This is how the decompiled method looks like. So it creates an anonymous class, which has actually this name part. And in order to get this name part, it calls us some reflect thing nearby. And if you actually have a look what happens inside, a scary thing arises. So what happens here is the naive way to do it would be just call reflection every time. Ask for a method called name, get the Java reflect method and call it. It's, this is ridiculously slow. In order to make it better, it uses caching. It will create a map which maps every class to which Java long reflect method was corresponding to the name. It will be created a linked list of these guys to not allocate a lot of memory and up to 160 elements, it will have this huge list growing. Because it doesn't want to introduce a memory leak, it will guard this list with a soft reference. Because every time you create a garbage collection, because you use classes as keys, you're keeping these classes from being garbage collected. And you may introduce memory leak this way by keeping the entire class loaders. What it means is that after every garbage collection, this entire cache can be removed. Then the order of entries in the list will, will change the next time and performance characteristics change. So what's happening here is you have a flective call whose, in order to speed up it, you cache the values and after every garbage collection, the cache can disappear. It can reorder itself because you have the actual caching is done through a list. The speed which we should do different invocation is different and depending on your luck, they are in different order because garbage collection once again can reorder them. So good luck predicting anything about the behavior of this code, either memory behavior or performance behavior. And just to go one, two slides back, you've wrote two simple lines of Scala code and they compiled in this horror. So the thing is, so far, Dota doesn't support structural types. We believe this is a feature which is very easy to shoot yourself in the leg, in the foot. Uh, we're still observing the community to see how widely are they used. If, if, and if in the places where they're used, there it is actually a proper use of them. We're willing to remove this feature. So far, we haven't seen an important enough use case to maintain this complexity and have this unpredictability for user. We intend to have similar things like record types, which will reuse more or less the same syntax but we don't want to be able for people to shoot themselves in the leg that easily. If they want to shoot themselves in the leg, there are still multiple ways to do it. But they just want to be more explicit about it. Okay, so another example, the same initialization order. So here, there is a superclass, A, and there are A1, A2, and A3. And the A has defined a single field. B, which it assigned to one. The first class didn't do anything, it just inherited. And the field was successfully initialized. The second class overrode the field and said that he wants to initialize it differently. And field wasn't initialized. And you, you're able to observe uninitialized value. The third class said not, that not only it redefines it, but it does it for all the subclasses. And now you're able to observe the future value. What it more or less means is that in traits, you can't rely for even for immutable fields for them to have any value that you've wrote inside initialization box. This is something that we were trying to change in Dotty, but there are actually two issues happening here. So the first one is what happens when you see uninitialized value. It happens because of the way how we encode 
makes sense. Initially, Dotty had a scheme of mixing which disallowed to see you to see initial uninitialized value. You were actually able to rely on the values that you saw. We implemented it. We started writing code with it, and the problem was that there was no clear migration path between the current scheme and the new scheme. There are complex corner cases where they behave differently. And Doty actually had examples of code where, without knowing, we relied on the fact that we can observe initialized fields. This, we believe that the same happens somewhere deep in every code base. We believe that we can hardly create a migration tool which will allow us to migrate from one scheme to another. It's very unlikely that we will be able to change this ever in Scala. If we were to design a new language without legacy, maybe the other approach would have been better. But because we want the community to actually migrate, we can't apply the new scheme. So we're doing the same similar scheme to the one which is used in Scala C. It uses several optimizations to actually make the fields final. It's an implementation detail that in Scala C, actually the trains, the fields defined by trait are never final. We came up with schema dot which allows them to be final to be better optimized, but you still observe the same behavior. Because otherwise, if we'll change behavior to be more reliable, you have millions of lines of code of Scala already written in community. And some of it somewhere deep will start behaving differently. And it's hard to write the code which will work the same consistently between two implementations. So it wasn't an option for us to fix this issue because we will create a bigger issue of migration. But there's another issue here which had with future value. So if you make this val final, there is an optimization which kicks in that the getter for a field won't actually use the field. It assumes that, okay, it's always three. I'm free not to use the field and I will just always return the constant. This is an interaction of two independent assumptions uses this of world final. One usage of the world final means nobody can override it. The other usage of the final means that everybody else can rely on it not being overridden and can inline it, can assume that the value is always the same. In Doty, we want to decouple two notions. For the second meaning, which means the value can be inlined, we'll have an at inline annotation which is the same one which macros will be using, uh, or inline keyword, more likely. Uh, and here, the migration pass is easier, because we can specifically f flag this final val, which has a constant type inferred, which all of this is required, that it's going to be deprecated. And like this, in this previous example, where we have A and A2, there is no particular place where, from which this issue originates. This is an interaction of inheritance and between several classes and one class relying on the ability to see specific value. We decoupled this, uh, these two issues. We were able to solve one of them and create migration paths for it. For the other one, there is no clear migration path and it's here to stay. Pandora's matryoshka, if you like. <laughs> yeah. Uh, another feature which we were trying to remove hard was autotoppling. Autotoppling is the ability to take multiple arguments and pass it to a function which takes a tuple. Or if you have a generic function which takes a single argument and you need to infer the type of it, well, you can actually infer a tuple type if you're passing too many arguments. This is a source of many pitfalls in, and puzzlers in Scala. But it's also a source of several valid design patterns. For example, that's the way how entire spray interface is written. They write entire interface by making the interface accept tuples. And then all the arguments are more or less optional. You can write them in easy way. You don't need to know about carrying. There's, they introduced an entire magnet pattern four years ago. And it's used widely in community. We can't remove this feature. The standard library actually relies on it. We need it to stay. What we can actually do, and what people don't rely on, is the fact that absence of a thing can be adapted to a tuple one, to a tuple zero. This is a reason why this two set example exists. We can insert a unit there, and when you call two set brackets, inside the brackets there's actually a unit being passed. This example no longer compiles in Dotty. 
In this case, the migration pass is easy. It no longer compiles. Now, if you were actually relying on checking if there is a unit inside, you will just insert the brackets inside. If you want to make sure that the trend is used before, once again, the migration tool will rewrite it for you. But in either case, you're not going to face a code in, comp in runtime which behaves differently between two compilers in this case. But if you actually want to make sure that the puzzlers which happen to do with other kind of tuples aren't there, we introduced language import, which disables auto-tupling. And for all the new code, it may be a good idea to have it in. So far, this is an easy way that we try to see how much we will and how can we create the migration path to slowly remove it. Not from the entire community, because part of the community relies on it, once again, magnet pattern and spray. But for people who don't want to be puzzled. OK? You know when you've been puzzled. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's late, I know. So this is a wonderful example. And the fun part is, so who thinks this code runs the same here? OK. The thing is, the first example doesn't even compile because you have a future reference. You have a forward reference. The second does. But the fun part happens not only because it doesn't compile, but because it will actually behave differently in runtime. And the magic here is not because the app, it's because of something called delayed init. Who here knows what's delayed init is? Surprisingly a lot. Okay, so for those who don't know, the delayed init is a magical trait which compiler is aware of. And if you directly or indirectly inherit delayed init, what you write inside in class body, not trait body, but if you're a class, it only applies if you're a class. If you write stuff inside a class who directly or indirectly inherits delayed init, what you're defining in a body is not methods and fields, it's a lambda which will be passed to a magical method. So it means if you try to override something in the class which inherits delayed in it, you're not. Because you're actually not writing the method body or the class body. If you're trying to define the fields, you're not defining the fields. You're defining a complex lambda which has local variables. There is a lot of interaction of features which happens here. And a lot of unexpected behavior which happened here. The compiler actually tried then to fix it back by retroactively making some of them B fields and B methods, making it less surprising in example of Hello World, which is app, but even more surprising if you actually use it in complex examples in production. The main reason why this existed is the Hello World example. And if you try to use it in very complex examples like this, when you have a class somewhere nestly, nested deeply, and it suddenly creates a lambda inside, all the compiler phases which will be participating in this creation of lambda and everything which was before need to be aware of this dark magic of delayed in it. This code crashes all the versions of Scala compiler ever published. The reason why this existed was that we wanted to make it easy to write the hello world method. And the point is that now we have an easy way to do it. And we have an easy way to replace the entirety of delayed in it. It was because you weren't able to have traits which take constructor arguments. You were kind of inserting a method call which can't get an argument inside the parent trait because parent trait doesn't get the arguments. Now this entire functionality can just be implemented in a simple, well, three or four lines, depending how you count, trait. And all this complexity can go away from compiler. All these puzzles can go away. And that's wonderful. The similar thing is happening to XML. This is a feature which we don't need that much. This is a feature for which we have a replacement which is better. And this allows us to make the language cleaner. This is a feature which is not used as much in production because 
it's very unlikely that your production code has many apps and many entry points which aren't main methods where you want to control more. It's very easy to track the locations where you're actually relying on this behavior because it's, you're asking for it explicitly. You're extending delight in it. And the migration pass will be very simple here. It can be rewritten to the code which behaves the same. So, in the end, the question is, what can you do today to have less puzzlers, given the fact that the puzzlers are, some of the puzzlers are here to stay, some of the puzzlers Dotty will help you to get rid of. But Dotty puzzlers may be a book which will get published soon. Small book, have to be really cheap, hopefully. But uh, no, I mean, so this wasn't, of course, this is intended to be an educational session and a session to raise awareness of some, some interesting things and obviously to show how making some some fundamental but also some relatively simple changes can do a lot to make our usage of a very powerful language safer and easier and like some of them we may not have seen yet and, and some of them some of these problems we may have already run into and have to become uh, sort of immune to but unless you are well, you can of course switch to dotty today and i'm sure that i definitely give it a shot and see some of the differences but what did so you have a scala code base today it's already there what are you going to do so um well i mean i think the first thing and there's nothing in here that you haven't seen in one way shape or form already um have a style guide or download get a style guide i mean if you look at all the companies and all the teams that use scala over time at growing scale they all develop their own kind of flavor not that they use different you know different languages or different compilers but they all have these set of rules about don't touch this and we all develop these kind of intuitions ourselves but make sure you have one and if you think of the new people coming onto your team make sure they have somewhere to go so they don't just end up copy pasting code blindly from all over the place but they have a clear set of uh, ideas about what you consider to be good and what you consider to be not so good and knowing where pitfalls lie can obviously inform what this style guide looks like uh, there are sort of I guess automated versions of style guides to some extent, called you know, linters or, or other things that you can use, or there are compiler plugins, and Bill wrote one called uh, Super Safe that instead of doing this in a sort of rule-based way actually fails your, your compilation if you do certain weird things that your team doesn't really think is a good idea. Um, so there are some tools, of course, that you can use and configure, can configure rather, um, to enforce or to, to prevent some of the pitfalls that you've heard about today. Um, and of course, there's a ton of compiler options. The, the, the classic one, like the, the, the mother of them all, would be fatal warnings. Because um, a lot of the stuff, I mean, a lot of the puzzles we showed, there will be a warning line emitted. Um, and I think fatal warnings is a really good thing, but I sometimes also joke it's a bit like global warming, because it's like we all know warnings are a bad thing, and we always think about like switching this on when it's far too late. Um, because anybody who's working on an existing code base has thousands or hundreds or whatever of warnings and it's just too late. If you try fatal warnings now, um, yeah, you're probably going to spend a week just getting your code to compile again, so you just don't do it. Um, and so, and this is true, I think, of all these, well, f first of all, let me caveat that by saying um, xlint, for instance, is pretty blanket and has a lot of things where you might think, well, I'm actually okay with that, or it's just annoying to get a warning there. You can be very specific about the compiler warnings that you want. Like you can enable uh, infer any, the warning for that. Like when any is inferred and you probably don't want to, you can like get a warning for that, but you might find you know, any uh, unit or value discarding is okay. And so you can, you can be quite fine grained about what kind of things you want to warn about. But I guess the main thing is all these choices are sort of opt in. It's a bit like life insurance or, or fire insurance. When you get that, well, usually after your house is burned down. I mean, the problem is you don't opt in for things after things have gone wrong. And I think all the people who said, no, I've been developing for five years in Scala or more, after our second or third project where we end up with like a, a, a steaming pile of Jenga, then we sort of decide, okay, next time we're going to do this better. But that, I think, is a key lesson you can learn. Like, think even for the new projects and, and, and for new teams that you're setting up or whatever, think of those rules up front. Like, how do we want to develop this stuff? And of course they change over time, but try to start with fatal warnings up front, for instance, if that's one of the tools that you want to use. Yeah, and because Dotty is going up soon, try it. We have a where there is a manual which helps you to get it, the setup running in your machine. We have integration with SBT. Uh, we can use libraries compiled by Scala C. 
So you can actually try to write your application and see how it behaves, even without requiring the entire ACA to be recompiled, or you're recompiling it. Uh, but the point is, .t is now being actively developed. If you're a library author, and there are some puzzlers which puzzle you, or puzzle your users, it's a nice moment to speak with us. Uh, so currently, the most puzzlers which are removed in Dotty happen to be with features which we decided are very, very harmful, like structural types, like uh, unknown return type of explicit implicits, which makes your compilation a lottery, whether it will compile, whether it won't, what it will resolve. So you can actually make this Russian roulette of your production code. Uh, so, but the point is, if there is something which bothers you, let us know. Have a look at whether your code compiles. Have a look at whether the features that you rely on compile. So far, to the best of our knowledge, most of the code compiles. Most of the puzzlers actually, which are in the schedule puzzler, are there to stay. Some of the puzzlers fa now fail compilation, which is a safe way. Only a single puzzler to the best of my knowledge, actually behaves differently. And this is a puzzler where I don't think anybody will write this code. This is a very synthetic example. But to be realistic, we, it, it's, there is no way we can improve stuff without breaking at least something. And sometimes we need to make hard decisions. And well, this puzzler, to be honest, has to do with singleton types, the way they are currently in Scala compiler. They are there, but they were never extended to escape. This is an example where they do escape, even though you're not even allowed to write the signatures which are participating in this example by hand. So in this sense, Dot is a lot better. Dotty behaves more like as if you wrote the type signatures by hand. But if you're actually Ill relying on inference of types that nobody could ever write, or inference of types which if ever there is a type error, this type is impossible to read, because also it's impossible to write. It's maybe now a good situation for you to come to us and discuss your use case. Because we're trying to make sure that people aren't scared with type errors. We're trying to make sure that people can predict what happens in their source code. And inference of funny types that you can't write is one of the sources of puzzlers. Just, just out of curiosity, pretend Martin's not here. Uh, who here has downloaded Dotty and tried it? That's a bunch. So it's, I mean, I also for myself, like I've had it in the, my mind for so long, and it's always been something that, I, in sort of mentally, I thought, oh well, it, it'll be ready, and then I'll watch the release announcement, and then I'll try it. Like it's ready now. Like you can try it and download it and compile your code, and a lot of it will compile. It's not something that is, you know, uh, there's a few lines of code somewhere, and eventually it'll be ready. Like give it a shot. It's really worth it. It's just faster. It's dramatically turbocharged compiler. Yeah, so it's faster and it has color drapple. <laughs> Can't give you a better argument than that. Okay. All right. We care a lot about binary compatibility. We care a lot about migration. Please tell us if you see any problems. Thank you.